Today on the bench I have a Matco MT1769 half inch air impact. My customer told me it started to smoke and there's only a couple of things that are going to cause that in an air tool. I can't wait to get into the guts of this to check it out. The tools we're going to need are a Torx T25 bit, a pair of snap ring pliers, a pocket screwdriver, and a pair of pliers. I love using the smooth parallel jaws of the Nipex pliers wrench. Any pair of pliers will do though for what we're going to use it for. I love these because they don't mar a surface and the jaws move parallel regardless of how wide you have the handles open so it makes it easier to grab certain things and I'll show you why we're going to use that. Let's dig in. The first thing to do on these is to remove the four body screws in the rear and these screws pass through the body into the hammer assembly and they hold everything tight. Separating these two pieces is a gasket that goes right in between so we have to be mindful of that when we take these apart. When you do that keep it on a horizontal surface and pull the pieces apart so that you don't have either the rotor assembly falling out or the hammer assembly falling out. When you pull this apart, <laughs> I see what the problem is already, but when you pull these apart, be careful that you don't lose any parts. Make sure you're mindful of how things are coming apart. Well, I see the problem instantly, and one of them is <laughs> there's a, a spline drive that goes on the end of the rotor, which is this piece here inside this assembly, and that broke right off. So the reason this was smoking was due to the friction of those two halves of the broken spline drive grinding together. Now, interestingly enough, when he plugged this in and showed it to me, the anvil was turning. So there clearly was enough of a, of a meshing between the, the broken pieces there that was still able to turn. Uh, and certainly he would have had a distinctive loss of power and... Uh, you know, performance degradation all around. So that's problem number one. Let's keep digging and see what else we can find. The next thing to come out is the hammer assembly from its housing here. And that just turns on its end and falls out. The gasket will also pull off. This is a plastic gasket. Uh, we're going to inspect this for wear. And it also comes off a particular way. There is a tab right there that fits into a slot right there. So it's hard to screw it up. Putting it back on is easy enough. You just have to know that there is a right way and a wrong way to put it on. On the hammer assembly, you have the hammer cage here, the two hammers and the anvil. And you have two pins here and here that hold the entire thing together. Just push those pins out with a pocket screwdriver and the whole thing comes apart. First, uh, this twist the uh, anvil a couple of times and pull that out. And then push the pins out. Keep the assembly horizontal and just lift the cage off the hammers. There's your two hammers. Now here's the hammer cage. This is the spline end of the rotor that is 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 lodged in there it should not live in there this piece right here should be attached to the rotor so when you pull this out that hole should be empty i'm just going to drop it all over the place because that's one easy way to remove the bits that's stuck in there remember get it everywhere and there's your your spline drive in the, in the hammer cage that should be devoid of any pieces all the time Removing the rotor is very simply uh, a matter of tilting the rotor assembly and the entire thing comes out. Now we have to take this apart to its component pieces. One of them is this plastic plate on the front just pops off and ideally it should pull straight off. 
sometimes you might have to uh, hold it like this and tap the spline drive that usually protrudes through the front here but because it's broken off it doesn't do that so you know we might need a we might need a little help from our friends in the form of a punch and a hammer but it looks like we're making some progress just working it with the hands here yeah there you go so this piece comes off in the front here is a bearing you can see it turning there this presses into the plastic plate I have learned something interesting about these bearings recently. I thought these were a sealed bearing, but I was informed by a few of you that these are in fact not sealed, but they are shielded. And that means something a little bit different for how these guys keep grease and stuff out of them. There's a, a metal shield that presses onto the race there between this inner ring and this outer ring between the races. And it's not impervious to things like uh, liquids and solvents and dirt. So it was uh, told to me that I need to be careful when I clean these with the solvent in the solvent tank because I can, in fact, get solvent inside of that bearing and wipe out all the grease that's in there, in which case these would be need to be relubricated. But doing that to a shielded bearing is very tricky because that's a crimped on metal shield on there and to get it off means ruining it. So it's probably a good practice just to replace them every time. They're not expensive, but sometimes they are on back order. But we're going to check this out a little more in depth and see. Sometimes you have to do a little work to get these bearings out. Sometimes they just pop out on their own. Or if I drop it, <laughs> like I already did, sometimes they just pop out. And this guy's working itself out on its own. I'm just going to go from the back side and push it out with a screwdriver. There's your bearing. And there's one like this on the back side that holds, the, on the back side of the rotor as well. To get the rotor out, what we have to do is pull the selector switch off, and that's just a press fit. So you just pop that off using a pair of pliers. Just like that. And that pulls out fairly easily. If it's any more difficult than that, something's really weird. But there's just a, a little metal, uh, rather a plastic tab there that guides the selector through the slot there. And that's the middle slot of the three. There's the back side of the, ro of the rotor. Here's that bearing I was talking about, and it's held in with this snap ring that goes around the outside of the rotor spindle. You can see the two holes right there. That's what we need the snap ring pliers for. Take a snap ring pliers. Put them in there and be very careful when you do this, when you spread that snap ring. Watch that it doesn't slip off your pliers and go flying somewhere. It's very difficult to find, and it's extremely important. So don't lose that. And when you put it aside, like I'm going to put it in a box here with all the parts, make sure that it's that it's kept safe, it doesn't fall through any cracks in your box or get lodged under one of the cardboard flaps. Not having this later on is going to cause you fits if you don't find it. So make sure you know where this little guy goes. Once that's out, the rotor just pulls out of the housing. There's your housing. The bearing just fell out on its own, which is always good because this can be tough to work with because it's such a tight fit sometimes. Sometimes you need to apply heat to the housing to expand it to get this to, to go in or out. Luckily, it came out on its own. And here's the rotor. There's going to be seven plastic veins in the rotor slots and that is what the air grabs hold of when it goes through the tool and spins the rotor. These just fall right out of their slots. And we see the spline and is broken clean off so we're not even going to bother to inspect the rest of this although uh, it does look like it, it has some very old burned lubricant on it. That's not relevant to us because this whole piece is getting replaced. While we're doing that, we're also going to replace the veins because these can wear on this long edge here. And that edge is important for the efficiency and the power that you get out of the rotor. I have seen people sand down that edge just to give it a, a new life. Um, but they're fairly inexpensive, and if they're worn already, I just as soon replace it. I mean, we're all replacing the rotor. We might as well replace this too. And that way we'll, we'll get full benefit out of having all new components at the heart of this thing. 
Next is to remove the valve assembly and this is held in with a spring clip that has two tabs. One sticks through the slot in the handle on this side and turn this around and you'll see an identical slot on the other side. And there's two tabs here on a metal spring clip that need to be depressed. I use a pocket screwdriver, although Ingersoll does make a tool just for this, but I'm fine with I'm fine with my method here. And the way you do it is you, you push down on that tab. I'm gonna show you how to go first. You push down on that tab and then work it so that you push the tab down just a little bit and there's gonna be enough movement to catch the top of that tab on the inside of the handle. While that's stuck there, you go around the other side and do the same thing. When you push that and move it down, now you've freed up the spring clip and you can just pull the whole assembly out. So first one side and then the other. And this, this can take some work sometimes. It can, this is not always cooperative. So I might have to do a little grunting and groaning here to get it right. You might be able to hear each side clicking as I try to work the other side. The other side will pop back out and that's the click sound that you hear. You just got to work it a little bit and be careful that you don't jar the side loose that you just got caught up in there the way you want. Like every time I do it, I hear the other side snapping back into place. There's easier ways to do this, I'm guessing. Maybe use a couple of screwdrivers. I don't know. Uh, this is the method I've always used. It's a bit of a struggle for me, but, you know, the struggle's real. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger. All right, that looks like I got both sides um, tensioned in there, so you just have to pull the entire assembly out. That's why I use the pliers. And this should just pull straight out. And something's holding it up in there. I don't know what it is. All right, I had to take this over to the bench vise and I just put this in the vise drills like that and use some extra force just to pull up. So it, it popped right out. It must have been that the, I don't know, something was hanging up. The, the ears on the retainer clip seemed okay. Now this is the clip here. You can see there's one ear that pops up there, the other ear pops up there. And that's what fits in those slots. So when you have this in the tool. So when you have this in the tool, what you're doing is you're pushing down here on this side of the tab and pushing that way. See what I mean? You can't push down on this side because then there's nothing to push against. You push down on this side of the tab, you push that way, and then you flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. You just got to push down to spring those in and get it and hold it up on the inside of the hand of the handle and then the whole thing should just pull out. This is the valve stem that the trigger hooks onto. And when that's all the way up, then the trigger inserts in the body and just hooks right onto the, to the clip. So this is the entire assembly. This can be disassembled further if there were a problem with the valve. There's a, there's a snap ring in there. You would take that out and then you pop out the valve assembly. And there's the valve stem here and a, and a rubber valve seat and a spring. But I'm guessing that's okay. When the customer demonstrated this for me, it seems like it's blowing air just fine. So the only thing that we're going to take off right now is a spring clip. And that just slides off. The two things that are left are the valve inside and directional selector switches. These 
are geared to ride on some teeth on that valve in there. You can see when I push one, I pivot the valve when I push the other. See that? And what side this is facing dictates which side of the rotor the air goes up and around, thus indicating the direction, either forward or reverse. So the way we take the selectors off are on the inside surface, there's a tab. You just use a pocket screwdriver to wedge in there and then just pop that tab out. And that comes right out. And you can see how the, the gear teeth are in there and they'll engage with the teeth on the valve. And then just do that same thing for the other one. And that pops right out. Then that valve just pushes down and through the handle. And pops out the bottom. And here you can see the teeth that the selector switches engage with to turn this. And you also want to check this for damage because there are some very small, delicate parts up here that can be broken if someone previously worked on it and jammed it in incorrectly. There's also a couple of O-rings, you want to check those. So we'll clean it all up and give it a look. And there's one more gasket in here. In the back, here is a gasket in the back. That just pops out. Just reach in there with a pocket screwdriver and you can pull it out. And that's it. We are completely, fully, 100% stripped down. Everything's going to go through the parts washer. And I'll get it all cleaned up. We'll inspect everything real well. And then we're going to write up an estimate for the repair. Here's all the component parts laid out after they've gone through the parts washer. I didn't notice anything damaged when I was putting it through there, cleaning it up. But I'll dry them off, wipe every piece down gets any residual grease off of it and it gives me a chance to do an up close inspection on each individual piece. So far the only thing I found was the rotor and we'll replace those veins. I will go on to my part suppliers website which is a company called Power Tool Repair in Ohio and they have schematics for all the makes and models of every power tool that they service, air tools, cordless battery tools, it doesn't matter. They service most everything, and they have schematics for all of it. So go we'll go on there, and I'll just order the parts up. Rather, I'll uh, I'll price them out first, and then talk to my customer and see if he wants to go through with this. Usually, you're going to go through with the repair on this because it's significantly less money than buying one of these new. Right now, the Ingersoll 2235Ti Max is going for about $600 on the truck. Get them somewhere else for less, yes, but you're still far above the cost of just buying a couple of new parts. And, and my labor rate of putting it back together again. I charge a one hour, one hour labor rate of this, uh, $50, and the cost of the parts, and that's all the customer is gonna pay. Usually, with stuff like this, replacing a rotor, I'm gonna guess it's gonna be around $120, $130, maybe, maybe right around that ballpark. So, you typically they say yes to the repair cost because it's so much less than the replacement cost. So, I'll, Get all that information put together, talk to my customer about it, and I'll meet you back here to tell you what he says. All the parts came in pretty quick. There were a few things that were listed on back order, but come to find they were not actually on back order, which was great because we can get this all fixed up and back to the customer faster than I thought. So it's great because I kind of under promise and I will be able to over deliver. He said he was good waiting with whatever time it took to get the, the parts in, but they're all here. Here's that gasket that resides in the body of the impact. A set of seven rotor blades. This is the gasket that goes between the hammer housing and the rotor housing. It's simply called the red gasket. 
two new bearings and the rotor. These things go back together pretty quickly. Everything has been cleaned, dried, and ready to go. So we're going to start with the rotor housing here and reassemble the valve and the whole valve assembly first. Here's the valve and it goes up through the hole in the handle and when it comes to rest at the top this tab here has to be facing toward the rear of the housing. And there's a couple of O-rings on there so I just put a little bit of lubricant on them to keep them moving freely. And this just inserts in the hole and then use something with a, a long handle like a pick or a screwdriver or something just to push it up the rest of the way until it comes to rest at the top of the hole. Like so. Alright, and get this lined up so that this is angled as far back as the, sele as the selector switch will allow. Because when we push this in, it's going to travel along the gears on that valve to get it seated properly. So these just sit back into the rear of the the unit and you have to depress the little tab that keeps them in there just to get it past the back here so it slides in nicely and just press it in and you can see the valve rotate and then you take the other one and do the same thing And when you get that in, you press it and you see that it moves the valve. So the valve is moving 45 degrees to either side like it should. And you can tell you have it equal when you see the edge of the tab back here line up with the edge of this square piece here. And you can see it's equidistant so you get the tab lined up on both sides of that square piece. That's what tells you that you got everything lined up properly. Next we put this gasket in the back and it just slides in place. There's little channels in the gasket that slide into little grooves back there. You'll see it all line up when you try to put it in. It, you can't put it in incorrectly, I guess. And it just slides in. There you go. Here's the valve assembly that you just have to make sure that you put the clip back in properly and it slides onto this one spot just like that and it clips into place. So make sure that's in there firmly and then you might have to depress the tab a little bit to get it past the cutouts on the grip. So once you have it rested on the top there, just push one tab in and then the rest of it just sets in. Mind this little ring here that you have it seated all the way down to the bottom, like that there, and push it in until it clicks, just like that. Next we put the trigger in. Put a little bit of lube on the O-ring on the trigger. And this can just slide in, and the little hook there will engage the valve stem. So slide that right in, and you'll know. And you'll know you got it right when it springs back and forth and does not pull out. Next, we put the rotor back in its sleeve, and then around the back, we got to put the snap ring on it to retain it. So this goes in with the spindle with the groove facing toward the rear because it has to come out through that hole. like that and then we have to put one of the new bearings in there. We will see. Oh, and that bearing presses right in beautifully. Sometimes these fit extremely tight. You might have to apply some heat to the sleeve here to slide that bearing past it, but it went perfectly on its own.
when you put the snap ring in, test it to be sure it seats properly, that the, that the snap ring sets in the groove around the base of that spindle. So I press down on it a couple of times with a screwdriver, make sure that I don't hear it click. And then the real test too is to see if I can just slide that ring around the groove. That means it's in there correctly. And the ounce of prevention that you take now is going to be worth a pound of cure later on. If that ring were not seated properly and it fell off, then the rotor would be loose and you'd have kind of a small nightmare. Take everything apart again, you'd probably do some damage and you'd have to, you'd have to probably buy yourself some new parts and put it all back together again. So just make sure that that ring is seated properly. Now we put the new rotor blades in and you can see how the rotor is offset within the housing. There's a gap up here where there's no gap down here between the edge of the rotor and the housing. So we're going to insert the blades in the top here where there's a gap. When you slide those in, the long flat face has to go up to meet the, out, the inside surface of the sleeve. And what I like to do is put a little bit of lubricant in there because it's going to need some, not too much, don't go heavy. And I just put a drop in each vein slot. I've had some viewers comment about the amount of lubrication to use in here. There are people who say you don't, you, you can't use too much lube. That excess lube will be forced out during operation. I have, however, seen where there has been too much lubrication put in here from people who have done previous work on these and it has prevented the veins from extending out of their slots. So don't go too heavy. It's very easy not to. So be reasonable and the veins just slide right in. Move the, the rotor slot to its next position. Slide it in. Once you get all the veins in there, just spin it a few times, make sure it's spinning freely, and watch to make sure that the veins extend out of their slots when you spin it. See how that works there? Now that the rotor and veins are retained properly in the sleeve, we're going to put the speed selector in place. And there is a tab right there that fits into this large center slot. There is an O-ring on here, so put some lubrication around that before you put it in. I already did it. And that just presses in. And this just slides in. There is a square channel there that fits over that square tab in the housing. So that's how you know it's lined up properly. And when you get it, the speed selector here comes out flush with the surface of the housing. It does not protrude beyond it. This is, this is correct. When you put the plate on, line up these screw slots here with the slots on the body here. The two on the top are a little bit closer together than the two on the bottom, so there is a right way and a wrong way. And you know you got it correct when you can see that all the screw holes in the slots line up properly. Perfect. Now we just drop the bearing in there. And this should go in pretty easily. The face is plastic, uh, the plate is plastic, so there shouldn't be any real resistance there. That just drops in like that. Now, this assembly is complete. Let's put together the hammer assembly. We have the hammer cage, two hammers, the anvil. And the housing, as well as the new gasket. 
We also need the two hammer cage pins. It's these guys. Here's the hammer cage and the two hammers just drop right inside. There is a right side up and an upside down of the hammers. You can see that they look like little ghosts. The head in the middle there and the hands in the air. One ghost has his hands facing up and the other has to have his hands facing down and then you just make them up like that and you can see when you look at both of them together they look symmetrical and then you have a large slot and a thin slot on the side of each hammer that have to line up. When you put them in the cage, hold the cage flat like that and then those slots go in the sides because that's what gives you clearance for the pins to go in. And the first pin usually goes in fairly easily. And sometimes the second pin you have to jiggle the hammers a little bit to get everything to line up. But that slides in too. Now your hammer assemblies together, don't turn this on end or the pins will fall out and the whole thing will fall apart. We're going to insert the anvil next and we're going to lube up the dogs on the anvil. So, you don't have to worry about going too heavy with the grease on this. It's, it needs some significant lubrication. And then, the anvil slides into the large hole in the front there and just jiggle that to get it setting correctly into the hammers. And you can tell it's right when the whole thing is flush. And we'll put some lubrication on the hammers as well. And smooth this out because it's not going to have clearance to get past the side of the housing if you don't and you're going to get grease all over the place. And these are very easy to put in. There's no right or wrong way. That just slides in the housing and then the anvil pops out the front. If you have excess grease out there, just put it back in. On the housing is a groove there and that fits the tab there on the gasket. Sets on like that. Now these two assemblies is made up. The easiest thing to do is keep it horizontal so that nothing falls out. There you go, just mesh the splines and you're back together. A dab of Loctite on the threads to the body screws. Now that all the screws started, we know that we have everything lined up properly and we can start tightening. When you tighten anything that involves a gasket like this does, you want to make sure that you tighten progressively and sequentially. So we're going to start um, on this guy. This has adjustable uh, clutch settings on it. So we're going to start at the lowest setting and then we're going to start in one corner, go to the opposite corner, then up and back down to the opposite corner. Now that we did first go around, we're going to turn up the power a little bit and do the same thing again. And go around one more time at a higher setting. Now that it's back together again, it's time to test it with a compressor. Unfortunately, I'm not able to do that with this one. And I have a viewer, a customer, and a 
really good guy named Larry B, who you've seen leave comments in other videos, and he's been involved in our live chats, and I really do appreciate your input, Larry, and you're an excellent customer. I really do appreciate your business, too. So he, he was ribbing me pretty good about how I didn't test an impact that I had in one of my previous videos because I didn't have the coupling on my compressor for the fitting that it had. And unfortunately, that's the same case here. I do not have a coupling for this fitting. I do have the right fittings, but my truck is in the shop right now and all my fittings are on the truck, so I can't test this one either. But there's very few things that can go wrong with these. Once they go back together, they're solid. I have every confidence that this one's working properly. But Larry, just to appease your need for closure on this, let's test it. Please keep watching the channel because we have all kinds of new videos coming down the line, including some cool firearm stuff that you haven't seen before, our regular Tools in the Hall segments, and more air tool repair videos. So do me a favor and click down here now to subscribe so that you don't miss any of it. Thank you so much for watching. And remember, use a tool. Don't be one. Yeah.